On today's show, we take a look at the exciting news that Paolo Bancaro and Rafael Stone were spotted having lunch in Houston Tuesday afternoon. What does that mean for the Houston Rockets? What does that mean for Paolo Bancaro? Also, we'll take a look at some of the names that will be available in the coming days via the NBA's virtual media availability ahead of the NBA draft and how Paolo Bancaro's name is not among those listed. And then we'll dive into the NBA draft profiles for Tari Eason, as well as Marjan Bochamp, their strengths, their weaknesses, their possible fit with the Houston Rockets, all of that coming up right here at Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. With the second pick in the 2021 NBA Draft, the Houston Rockets select Jalen Green. T-minus 15 seconds, guidance is internal. I'm going to keep working. I'm going to keep getting better every day. I'm going to keep perfecting my craft. And every time I step on that floor, I'm coming. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian and credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked on NBA Mondays, host of the State of the Rockets podcast, as well as the founder of ClutchCityControlRoom.com. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin and the show, of course, at Locked on Rockets. As always, we appreciate you for making LOR your first listen each and every single day. Now, uh, oh, yeah, free and available, all platforms, all that good stuff. Apple, Spotify, Google, uh, YouTube. Check us out on YouTube. Leave a comment. Those are always amazing. Exciting news in the Rockets world today after just, you know, not even a single morsel of information coming out of the Rockets organization. You've got other organizations posting media availabilities. You've got other organizations posting workout videos and all this stuff. And the Rockets just incredibly tight-lipped about the entire situation. And yet, Lo and behold, none other than the legend himself, Burt Steele, dropping a Burt bomb on the timeline Tuesday afternoon of Paolo Bancaro having lunch with none other than general manager Rafael Stone. Exhibit A, if you will. Boom, for our YouTube viewers. It's right there. Look at it. That's Paolo Bancaro right there with Rafael Stone. It's incredible. These gra- I know these graphics are just blowing you away. But... Incredibly exciting news because we've just been kind of sitting, you know, formulating, speculating all this stuff leading up to the NBA draft. We just haven't had a whole lot to go off of other than kind of piecing together tea leaves about what other organizations are going to do. And again, the Rockets are in this weird spot right this year. Third overall pick. You got the three big prospects at the top of the draft. Maybe there's a legit argument for Jay Nivey versus Paolo Bancaro at that three spot, but all the signs have been pointing towards Paolo Bancaro at third overall. Makes a ton of sense, but we just haven't had a whole lot of information coming out of the organization about their preference of these top prospects, other than just, again, like reading tea leaves here and there, little tiny morsels of information. This is the first like biggest piece of like clear cut evidence where it's like, oh, hey, he's in town for his workout. It was reported sometime last week that Paolo Mancaro had a workout scheduled with the Houston Rockets. It appears he was in town to accomplish that, had his meal with Rafael Stone, all of that. And it's just exciting stuff. It's exciting to see the prospect kind of, you know, being in Houston, seeing him, you know, with Rafael Stone, seeing him, you know, kind of engaged with the Rockets organization the way that we've seen Jabari Smith kind of engaged with the Orlando Magic, Chet Holmgren engaged with the Thunder, uh, Chet Holmgren on social media liking, you know, Thunder players, you know, posts on IG, Twitter, all that stuff. It's one of those where it, it, this is like our first like concrete little piece of evidence about Paolo Bancaro to the Rockets. And so it's fun to get excited about. It's fun to see, you know, where the, where these cards are going to fall with the NBA draft uh, almost exactly a week away, which is just crazy to think about. But in addition to the little Burt bomb from Burt Steele, the legend himself, dropped on a Tuesday, no less. It didn't happen at 545. Maybe the picture was taken at 545, but it was not posted till the timeline until late Tuesday evening. That said, you know, it was very cool to have that kind of, uh, you know, rally the troops, if you will, within the Rockets fandom. Everybody's so excited to see the news, all that. But Wednesday, we also found out that the NBA released its schedule for virtual media availabilities, pre-draft virtual media availabilities ahead of the NBA draft, which they've done in previous years. They did it last year for all the top prospects. But curiously enough, the only top prospect not currently listed in that group of virtual media availabilities is 
Paolo Bancaro. So why wouldn't Paolo Bancaro be doing a virtual media availability, you know, out, you know, in conjunction with the rest of the top prospects? I mean, Jabari's doing one, Chet's doing one, Jaden Ivey's doing one, Shaden Sharp's doing one, Mark Williams, Jalen Duran, uh, Dyson Daniels, like that, like all, a lot of the top prospects, about ten to. 14 of them, I think, if I'm ballparking correctly, are going to be doing these availabilities, and yet no Paolo Bancaro. Now, it's worth noting that in previous years, sometimes these virtual media availabilities, which are scheduled to take place over Thursday, Friday of the rest of this week, as well as Monday and Tuesday of next week, leading into the NBA draft, it's worth noting that sometimes these availabilities do get shuffled around, sometimes because of a, you know, a player's schedule conflicts, whatever. They maybe cancel one or they add one. And so maybe it's just because Paolo Bancaro doesn't have a spot in his schedule right now for them to lock in and say, oh, he's going to do this availability at X time. That could be the possibility. If we want to don our tinfoil hats, though, momentarily, and just ever so briefly, maybe it's because he's so confident in the Rockets picking him at number three that he doesn't feel the need to do one of these availabilities, right? It's kind of crazy how we look at like the, the differences between last year and the Rockets picking at number two and this year with the Rockets picking at number three and, and the prospects that were available to them. And last year, it was readily evident the Rockets favored Jalen Green, you know, leading up to and including the, you know, the final moments, the final days before the draft actually took place. However, there was some of the speculation about the Rockets, you know, aggressively pursuing the number one overall selection to maybe take Cade Cunningham, number one overall, if they could give, convince the Pistons to trade down one. Those were pretty much the only reported rumors, even though amongst the Rockets fan base, there was a lot of like Jalen Green, Evan Mobley, all this, right? It was very evident that the Rockets preferred Jalen Green above all else, and then maybe Cade Cunningham to Jalen Green if they had the option to get the number one overall pick. That didn't pan out. And so you had situations like Evan Mobley refusing to work out for the Houston Rockets because they had, you know, expressed so much interest in Jalen Green that Evan Mobley was like, you know what? I'm not even going to bother working out for you guys. I know I'm probably going to fall to Cleveland at number three. That's all she wrote, right? This year, similar kind of situation, right? Where you've got Jabari Smith, who knows he's a lock to go one or two, so hasn't worked out for the Rockets. You got Chet Holmgren, who feels like he's going number two overall. You got Pal. I mean, it's just curious to see how this year there's less of it, even though all signs point towards Paolo Bancaro at number three, it feels like there's less just outright belief of, yeah, that's exactly how things are going to shake out, right? Because maybe there's still that slim chance that OKC throws a gigantic wrench into the situation by, I mean, reportedly they're incredibly interested in Jaden Ivey. Um, it'd be, I think, insane of Sam Presti to take Jaden Ivey at number two overall, but Sam Presti, right? He's an outside-the-box kind of thinker. Maybe he thinks he can reach a couple spots and take Jaden Ivey. Maybe the Thunder managed to, you know, trade up and aggressively pick up, you know, the fourth or fifth overall pick from the Kings or the Pistons and make a play for Jaden Ivey that way. But there is reported interest from, uh, you know, the Oklahoma City Thunder that they are very interested in Jaden Ivey. And what does that do if you're the Houston Rockets? If you're sending all these signals to Paolo Bancaro that he's their guy at number three, if he's the guy that the Rockets want to take at number three, and then suddenly Chet Holmgren, even if it's like a 1% chance, is on the board at number three, would you be the team that passes on Chet Holmgren to take Paolo Bancaro? Even separating my personal biases from this, how would that look, right? If you give all these signs to a guy, hey, you're our guy at number three, and then if Chet Holmgren lands at number three and is still on the board, what do you do at that point? So maybe it's a situation where there's still that minute chance that Chet Holmgren falls to number three so the Rockets haven't just like completely publicized the fact that, hey, Paolo Bencaro is our guy. Like, you know, we're going to take him and all this good stuff. I think all the signs are pointing that way. It's like a 99.898% chance that it happens at this point. But it's still, again, until the, I can't even say until the fat lady sings, until the bald man gets up on the podium and makes the announcement, it's not concrete. It's not guaranteed. So we're eight days away from it. It'll be really interesting to see what actually pans out during the NBA draft, how that all plays out. But I do want to talk about the draft profiles that we've got lined up today because we're going to talk about Tari Eason and we're going to talk about Marjan Bochamp, a guy who I feel like has fallen in some of the recent mocks, but I'm still really, you know, incredibly enticed by 
uh, Bochamp's skill set. We're going to get to both of those guys in just a moment after a quick message from our friends over at Prize Picks. Because look, when it comes to daily fantasy, this is the number one daily fantasy option out there. It is the easiest way to get into daily fantasy. You need to check out the award winning app, Prize Picks. It's daily fantasy made easy. It's so simple. You pick two to five players and an over under on their projections, and you can win up to 10 times back on any entry. And it's just you versus the projected numbers. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that simple. Prize Picks is safe and offers incredibly fast withdrawals. You can use the award winning app on both the App Store and Google Play. And for a limited time, Prize Picks has an exclusive no brainer of an offer for all of our listeners. Listeners get $50 for free if a player in your first Prize Picks entry scores just a single point. All you have to do is use promo code MBA. That's right. This is an exclusive offer available to locked on listeners only. Sign up today and use code MBA to get $50 for free if a player in your first Prize Picks or an entry scores just a single point. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. The Ultimate NBA Mock Draft starts June 16th with over 50 insiders. Nothing equals the Ultimate NBA Mock Draft. The Locked on NBA Big Board Draft experts plus the Odyssey Insiders first pick is June 16th. Search the Ultimate NBA Mock Draft and follow now so you don't miss out on a single pick. Wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Google, check them out. Be sure to tune into the Ultimate NBA Mock Draft. Now, Let's talk a little Tari Eason here, who is my favorite number one prospect for the Rockets at pick number 17. There are a number of mock drafts that have Tari Eason falling to the Houston Rockets at pick number 17, which ultimately I thought that the Rockets may have been, you know, kind of forced into a position where if they were really interested in Tari Eason having to possibly trade up to acquire him. But if he is on the board at 17 and the Rockets don't select him, I will be distraught because I'm incredibly excited by him and just his his versatility at the NBA level, what he's going to be able to bring. I think he could very easily be a high-level difference maker type role player uh, and, and just he, his calling card is going to be defense at the NBA level. But truly, let's run through some of his numbers. So he's about six foot seven without shoes on, probably, you know, a little bit taller than that in shoes. So I'm just going to say a six, eight frame in shoes, seven foot two wingspan. So he's got absurd physicals, weighs about 220 pounds. He's got the agility, the foot speed to stick with smaller, faster players. He's got the size and strength to deal with stronger, bigger players. I think it gets overblown quite a bit uh, using the phrase can defend one through five. Uh, Tar Eason can probably legitimately defend one through five. Like he is, he has the physical gifts to do, to guard positions one through five, which is, again, I think it gets used way too often. Uh, and, you know, across NBA players trying to trying to decipher, oh, yeah, this guy's, a you know, an all-NBA caliber defender because he can defend one through five. Um, I think Tari Eason has the physical tools to actually be able to accomplish that. He is has a, has a high motor, constantly hustling on the floor. He's a great on-ball defender, great when it comes to off-ball defense, probably one of the best off-ball defenders, just general defensive IQ awareness in his class. Um, and then when you look at just his offensive side of things, he's a great interior scorer. He's able to get it done right at the rim, and he's a reliable three-point shooter. So we run through his numbers really quick. Averaged about 17 points per game, shot 37.1% from three, just under seven rebounds per game, about two steals and one block per contest, constantly playing passing lanes, constantly getting steals, racking up blocks, just one of one of the best defenders in this draft class, and that is absolutely going to translate to the NBA level. And so you package that with a guy who's already got a relatively reliable three-point shot, and that makes him an incredibly enticing prospect for the Rockets at pick number 17. Now let's bring up his shot profile here because his shot profile is a little weird. Um, now again, great interior scorer, great right at the rim. Uh, not so great in the mid-range. So when we look at his actual numbers, he shot 69% right at the rim. Nice. Um, his mid-range numbers are pretty atrocious. And then we get out to his, like, like if we, if we break down his mid-range numbers, let me just make this nice and simple for us. Um, 32.1% from the mid-range. And then we go all the way out to three-point range where he was absolutely on fire from the top of the arc. That's where he did most of his damage. Um, in fact, he did a majority of his three-point damage from above the break threes. He shot just 0% from the left corner and only two of five for 40% from the right corner, but very few attempts from either of the two respective corners. At the top of the key, he shot 48.3%, 14 of 29 attempts at the top of the key. 
From the right wing, shot 5 of 14 for thir- for just under 36%. And then from the left wing, he shot 30.5%, just 7 of 23 attempts from there, which brings us to our total three-point percentage of 37.1% for Tari Eason. Now, he, again, he's a guy, the mid-range doesn't exist for, for Tari Eason. Very unreliable mid-range shooter, but he's a guy that can get it done when you're finishing in and around the bucket, um, both by attacking off closeouts in the half court, as well as operating in transition, right? He's a guy that can get the rebound, can kind of push the ball up in transition a little bit himself, can fill uh, fill the lanes in transition and feast off of other guys kind of passing to him like a Jalen Green or a Kevin Porter Jr. or even a Paolo Banquero possibly bringing the ball up the floor. Uh, offensively, again, he's going to be able to space the floor offensively. He'll be able to feast off of those transition opportunities. He's got enough, I guess, you know, ability, coordination with the basketball in his hands to kind of drive and get to the rim himself. He's, his dribble is a little kind of wonky, like it's not the, the prettiest dribble of ever, but it's effective, right? You put a, a bigger, stronger player on him to check him, and he's going to be faster than them at, at, getting, at beating them off the dribble, getting to the rim. You put a smaller, quicker player on him, he utilizes his size and strength effectively enough to be able to overpower smaller guys. So much so that this is a kid who averaged a ton of free throws this past season. 5.6 free throw attempts in just 24 minutes of action. Basically one of the highest free throw rates in all of college basketball. He knows how to get to the rim, how to draw fouls, how to be effective in that regard. And he increased his shooting percentage to where you really like the fact that he's able to get to the free throw line. He shot 79% at the free throw line as well as the 37% from three. So he's got a quality shot with him offensively. Again, this is a guy who's going to live and feast above the rim. He's a guy that you can you know, conceivably play at the three, at the four. He could play small ball five. There's a lot of versatility to where you place him. Because he's going to be, uh, at least defensively, can guard almost any position on the floor. Offensively, he fills the exact need of a traditional like 3 and D type wing player. But he's got some legitimate size, can play some small ball five you know, in a pinch if necessary, depending on a mismatch or depending on a matchup, I should say. And then he's got a little bit more there where there's maybe some untapped offensive potential where, again, you know, right now a majority of his game is kind of as like a slasher, not necessarily like a guy that is going to go ISO one-on-one, you give the ball to, and he's going to break down defenders on his own, but off the catch, right? Have him stationed out of the three-point line, off the catch, attacking off closeouts, that kind of thing, and then feasting in transition is going to be mainly his offensive calling cards, at least right away. Now, when we look at the downsides to Tari Eason, I would say that at times... Both defensively and offensively, he managed to foul out of six games at the college level, which is kind of absurd. Just shows that he's being aggressive. Like, that's not necessarily a horrible thing. Um, Very aggressive defender, very aggressive player on both sides of the basketball, but at times can be a little tunnel vision, can kind of, you know, tuck his head down and just barrel through defenders. Um, Not necessarily, like, looking for the pass, looking for the right read, looking for the best way to finish. So I think at times he can be a little bit careless with the basketball uh, and maybe a little over eager when it comes to trying to play make or facilitate for his teammates, some bad passes, some bad decision-making at times offensively with the ball in his hands. But I think he's a guy, again, you put him in the right role. He'll understand how to fulfill that role offensively, not being asked to do more than what he's currently capable of. The other area of his game offensively that does give me kind of some pause for concern, even though the three point shot like looks good on the numbers it's a really low release point. Like he, it's not quite like a push shot from his chest, but he has an incredibly low release point for his for his just overall jumper for it, especially you know, again for his three point shot. That leads me to be a bit concerned, right? Because it could very easily be blocked at the NBA level. Guys can contest it a lot easier if that jumper's low and like in front of his face rather than being high and like above his head at the the release point for his jumper. So. You know, definitely some areas to be a little bit concerned about. I do think that, you know, overall, his the the pros for him far outweigh the negatives in his game. Uh, again, I do think there's maybe some decision making stuff there, at least offensively. I think defensively, the decision making is pretty solid. The just the the like, uh, the inherent like 
defensive IQ and awareness and just the defensive instincts jump out at you when you watch him play and you see the success that he's had on that side of the basketball. The offensive instincts need to be a little bit more refined, a little bit more polished. But again, I think he's a guy who he stays in his lane, spot up three point shooter, attack off closeouts, attack in transition, that kind of thing. He's going to have a lot of success right away at the NBA level, just doing those things offensively. So I love Tari Eason. I think he's an incredibly enticing prospect. I think he's the guy that I want the Rockets to pick number 17 overall if he is on the board. But with that, I do want to talk about one more prospect here coming up in just a moment. Marjan Beauchamp playing for the G League Ignite. We're going to get to him in just a moment after a quick message from our friends over at BetOnline because BetOnline.net is your number one source for all of your sports betting stats and info. Find the latest sports developments, news, and odds, including this year's finals odds, NHL, hockey, conference finals, Major League Baseball, and of course, The latest fighting news from MMA, UFC, even boxing. BetOnline is your continued source for all of your sports wagering information from live betting, esports, the NBA draft, and more. And speaking of the NBA draft right now, BetOnline has extended their odds for the first round of the NBA draft. Right now, you can take a look at the odds for who the Rockets will select with the third overall pick in the 2022 NBA draft. Paolo Bancaro, the odds on favorite at minus six. 100 to go number three overall in this year's NBA draft. You got Chet Holmgren at plus 1,000, and then Jaden Ivey at plus 1,200. So even Chet Holmgren, a more likely candidate to go number three overall than Jaden Ivey. So for all of that and more, head to their website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action available to you. Bet online. It's where the game starts. And final segment here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Be sure to go check out the Locked on NBA Big Board podcast. Host Rafael Barlow from NBA Draft Junkies and author of the NBA Big Board newsletter is joined by Richard Stamen, Sam Ferris, and Lee Thulin, giving fans an in-depth look at the NBA Draft, Mock Draft, Player Rankings, and of course, Big Boards. that's free and available wherever you get your podcast, wherever you listen to this podcast. Now, I want to go over Marjan Beauchamp here, who is, I, I think he has kind of fallen off the radar for for a lot of people on some, some of the most recent mock drafts that I've seen. I've seen him drop as far as like late first round uh, in some of these mocks. I've also seen him go kind of late teens, early 20s, give or take. I'm fairly confident he'll be on the board when the Rockets are picking at 17. I think he's a great option for the Rockets at pick number 17. He's definitely not at the top of my list, but for a lot of the same reasons that I'm really enticed by Tari Eason, I'm very interested in Marjan Beauchamp, although... I do think that Tari Eason has the shooting ability, which is definitely already a win over Bochamp, but incredibly, you know, gifted, uh, gifted wing. When you look at his physical, he's about six, six, maybe six, seven, uh, got a seven foot one wingspan. He is going to be a tough, gritty, capable perimeter defender at the NBA level. Another guy who very much could be kind of a, a defensive ace, maybe a Matisse Thibel type, great on-ball defense, great rebounder for his size. Um, and what I really love about him and, and the idea of like kind of folding him into what the Rockets are doing with their young core is he is great playing off the ball, but he's also capable with the ball in his hands. Like having guys who are multifaceted in that sense where they're not just incredibly one-dimensional offensive style players is appealing. And I think those are great kind of foundational players that you can really build upon and try to figure out something special with, because he's a guy that can, you know, utilize his ability to play off ball. He sets good screens. He knows how to kind of, you know, slip a screen or, you know, like set a screen and roll hard the rim and then like finish well, like in and around the paint because he's an explosive athlete. So if he's able to get, you know, a couple steps going to the rim, either with the ball in his hands, like getting downhill, or if he's just rolling or if he's operating in transition where somebody else is handling the basketball and he's able to just kind of fill one of those lanes in transition and just crash hard towards the rim and receive a lob or, you know, a quick bounce pass, whatever, he's going to finish at the rim. He's an incredibly gifted finisher in and around the rim. And again, for his size, he plays well above the rim, which is impressive. I think... Overall, he's a smart offensive player, especially offensively. Again, you can put the ball in his hands. He is a gifted ball handler, a guy who understands how to, you know, operate with the basketball in his hands, kind of has a lot of those guard-like skills, which is, you know, very easy to see when you watch him play. He's comfortable with the basketball in his hands, which you can tell when a player is comfortable with the basketball in his hands versus when they're just kind of like, all right, I can do something with this, but I don't exactly want it in my hands, right? Right. And so offensively, I think he has all the makings to be a a very great slasher, uh, driving, kind of, you know, attack off the catch type scorer. 
and a, a lot of his damage is going to be able to be, be able to be done in transition off of opportunities that he creates by being kind of that two-way force, that, that tone-setting defender, if you will, on the defensive side, where he forces turnovers. He forces, uh, you know, he applies a lot of ball pressure and creates opportunities for his team where he's able to get out and transition with his teammates and f- get those easy transition bucket opportunities. The biggest issue with him offensively is doesn't have a developed outside shot. And that's the biggest concern with Marjan Beauchamp is he shot just 24.2% from three in the G League. That is a legitimate, pretty big red flag. But given the versatility of all his other skill sets, like, and the basically you look at his game and the one hang up on his game is the fact that the outside shot hasn't, you know, translated just yet. That's concerning, absolutely. But as he works on that outside shot, as he puts more and more time into it, if he can get that three-point shot up to a respectable percentage, then you're talking about a an incredibly high-level role player who does everything that you want him to be able to do on both sides of the floor. And I know that a lot of this same argument can possibly be made about a guy that's already on the Rockets in Jay Sean Tate. The main difference between these two guys being that Marjan Bochamp is just 21 and a half years old, so... He'll be you know, 22 maybe around the time the season starts, if that. I don't know his exact birth date off the top of my head. Um, so he is a bit older as far as rookies are concerned. But at the same time, significantly less mileage in the sense of like, okay, this player is probably already who he is at this point in his career. And when you look at his jumper, there's nothing mechanically wrong with it. It's a good-looking shot, great-looking form, great mechanics. It just hasn't translated at the G League level. So... I do think there's legitimate pause for concern, or I guess pause for concern kind of works, but cause for concern is the actual phrase. We want to stick with that. Uh, When you look at a guy like Marjan Beauchamp, but I think when he when you look at what else he brings to the table, uh, a guy with that size, the ability to kind of play the wing, which the Rockets are, I don't want to say in desperate need of wings, but they need some size. They need some guys who they can be comfortable with on the wings, especially the way the NBA game is growing and looking in today's age where you need guys who are capable of defending multiple positions who can have the size and the defensive wherewithal to kind of anchor that side of the floor a little bit. They need good, sizable defenders. They need guys who kind of fit the mold of Atari Eason or of a Marjan Beauchamp, which is why I'm really, again, incredibly enticed by him as a prospect because the biggest hang-up on him, again, is the shooting. And I know that's a pretty big hang-up to have, unfortunately, But because of the way that everything else works out, his defensive IQ and awareness, his ability to put the ball on the floor offensively, both in transition and in the half court, his ability to play off ball, he's just a high IQ player, right? And when you go back and watch like the G League Ignite tape, he plays off of guys like Dyson Daniels and Jaden Hardy incredibly well, right? So imagining him in a situation with the Houston Rockets where he's able to play off of guys like a Jalen Green or a Kevin Porter Jr. or an Alperin Shingun or a Paolo Bancaro, this is the kind of guy that would absolutely feast off of playing with guys like that because he's just a smart player. He understands how to find easy opportunities, easy seams within an offense, both in the half court in transition to get easy buckets for himself. And even though the three-point percentage doesn't necessarily translate right away, Nothing mechanically worrisome about that shot to think where he couldn't get it to a place where it's at least a respectable percentage to complement the rest of his really enticing game, everything that he does bring to the table. So with that, those are my thoughts on Marjan Beauchamp and Tari Eason as they would relate to the Houston Rockets, what makes them enticing prospects for the Rockets to consider at pick number 17 with their second first-round draft pick in this year's NBA draft. With that, that's going to do it for today's episode. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing to the podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Google, the Odyssey app, free and available on all platforms. Also, check us out on YouTube. Go to YouTube, search Locked on Rockets, like, comment, subscribe. Let me know how excited you are about Paolo Bencaro's little secret lunch meeting with Rafael Stone. Let me know how you feel about Tari Eason and Marjan Beauchamp as prospects for the Houston Rockets in the YouTube comments. I do read each and every one of those every single day. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball.